organizacije po našoj predavanju. Pobavljili smo dva vrhunska arhitekta in prejske arhitekta iz Velike Britanije. Najprej bi predavali smo z Berlin, ki je arhitekt iz podnika Alison Morrison. Ne bom vam zdaj detaljal njemu razlaga, ki ste si tako veliko dobrali. Naslednji pa bo Christopher Bradley Hall, ki je ukrajinski arhitekt, je nekak v smislu do našega predavanja je predati sporovanje na ljubima, ki bo vas obdobljata na projektih. Morat še to povedati, da je Christopher Bradley Hall na potisem, ki je bilo njegovo letalo za vnudo, tako da zapričkamo vsa tem, tako da mogoče bomo mogli ne dobima na pitrašnjo vnudko pauze. Tako da, za začetek, gospod iz firmom, Please welcome to Ljubljana. Maybe I also should mention that you're here as a part of the Jewish Pagodian Festival. Yep. So, be kind to him, especially <laughs> if you're... So, clap, clap. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, Firstly, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Mika. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've never been to Jarrah before, so I've just had a brief tour this morning. Uh, and you know, a lovely a small city. It's fantastic. I love it. I'm not But um, what I thought I'd do is uh, introduce myself a little bit, introduce the practice, um, and then go on and talk about some projects. I'm going to firstly talk about some of our early work what we were doing when we were younger, uh, what we're doing now a little bit, and then move into some particular projects which highlight to start with some master plans and then to finish off with some particular projects which in a way come out of those master plans. So, um, now Isaac Morrison, that was our, our office by the way, that we've just seen there. Uh, we are situated in the south area of London, in Southwark, which you can see in that front. Just so you know, um, St. Paul's Cathedral is about here. The West End of London, there's uh, Regent's Park, Hyde Park, St. James's Park, House of Parliament. So we are right in the very, very middle of London. And in actual fact, when people talk about where the real centre of London is, they talk about it actually in terms of taxi drivers as being, as being southern. So we are right in the middle. And the office itself, well, we are quite large now. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. But um, we moved to Southwark in about 10 years ago, when we were about, I suppose, about 150 people. We started off about 30 years ago as about two people, obviously two family partners, Bob Allies and Graham Morrison. Um, I joined about three or four, four years later, when we were about seven. So we've grown from seven people in 1984, 85, up to what we are today, which is 300. So, um, it is really quite a story in terms of a, a, a practice that was once very small and has now become quite large. And so it's quite interesting when you're as large as that, not only how you maintain the quality of your architecture, but also how you manage the people that produce it. So um, those are stories I could go into a little bit, but, but I could definitely want to talk about the buildings today. Our, build, our, uh, our office here in Southwark, uh, we designed and built ourselves on a site that we bought from our for ourselves about 10 years ago. Uh, it's a five-story building, three-story interior on the first floor with offices on each of those three floors. But we have extended it. You can see um, here in the distance, that's the old, well, well I say the old building that we built 10 years ago. Uh, we've now subsequently built this studio space on the back of Farnham Place just here. Um, and then we've got um, a Victorian building in here that we refurbished and also owned, which is a bit uh, a listed building which we had to be rather kind to and we uh, renovated it. And you can see it's, uh, it's kind of immersed in what is quite a larger context around it. We have bankside uh, office buildings here, which we designed also for a rather large uh, commercial developer a few years ago. And you can see in the distance the Shard, uh, which is at London Bridge Station. So we're right in the thick of the city. Um, this is uh, the, in contrast to the main office building, this is the Victorian building that we converted uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we have a, a restaurant, or a cafe, I probably should call it more, on the ground floor, which we own as the original partners, um, but is run by a manager. And so 
we, uh, it's, it's a great little focal point for the office because our clients go in there before meetings. It's a real hub on the ground floor, but it's open to uh, the public, but also um, open to obviously people that, from the office. Um, talking about the early work, um, I suppose it's true to say that we started with very humble beginnings, very small projects. Important ones, though. This is uh, the Queen's House in Greenwich, uh, Inigo James's listed building. Lovely building. Um, and we, all we did, um, but it was a rather in, and a very important commission to us, was we put in a new staircase in, in the back area of the, of the building. Quite discreet in the way it was put in, but for us at the time, which is 20 years ago now, probably more than 25, um, this was a very important groundbreaking project because it was our, it, it summed up what we were really interested in at that time and still are, is how we deal with old listed historic buildings and bring new use to them or insert new or modern uses within them. And that, the idea of coexisting the new and the old is something which is fundamentally important to us. And as, as, you, as I go on, you'll probably see that that's now expanded into an interest in the city and how the city works and subsequently how we got involved in master planning. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, Blackwell House by uh, um, Bailey Scott, again, which we uh, uh, listed arts and crafts building up in Cumbria, uh, which we, again, it put in some new internals, uh, some small staircases and things like that, but also renovated the arts and crafts inter interior. So whilst we were completely uh, I suppose sensitive to how the internals existed and wanted to continue that in terms of their importance. We also inserted new and modern interiors to kind of complement the old and the new. Um, and then I suppose a uh, small building that we did in uh, North London, uh, slightly bigger though, uh, this is um, <coughs> Prince of Wales Road, what was a North London Polytechnic uh, art school and had open plan uh, studio space like this and then it had a, a, a yard at the back, a, a, a courtyard. And I suppose this is significant because it's the first time that we really started dealing with a space at the heart of um, our projects. And spaces you'll see become very important to us, just as much as the buildings themselves. Um, we looked at the space, we inserted, it was the yard that you can see in here. Uh, we converted the external fabric of the building into tracks and, and duplexes, and then inserted a new entrance uh, a building in, uh, in the centre over a single floor and had these kind of small yards either side which produced um, access up onto the upper flats and we even put, produced um, small extensions into the roof where so you see this new staircase that we inserted into the, into the existing fabric but actually stripped the uh, yard itself of some of the accretions and the add-ons that it uh, that it, uh, gained over time. Um, I think this is probably again another example of old meets new and how we are really interested in the in fact of uh, new and contemporary and modern architecture. And we are modernists at root, but how that can coexist with uh, a full understanding of the historic fabric that you insert in those modern elements into. And so that these are the upper floors in terms of the duplexes and the conversions into the, into the upper stories. Um, moving on into slightly bigger projects now, and these are all projects that we did a while back now. This is about 95, I suppose. This is a new Dublin embassy in, in, uh, in Oxford, Dublin. Um, it's a British embassy in Dublin, and it's again formed around a courtyard. It sits in, on the outskirts of Dublin in an area which is traditionally at uh, rather large manor houses and, court, uh, uh, and, and strong residential area in, in, as a whole. And uh, we had to actually um, be quite uh, sensitive in the way that we inserted what is, is in, a, in fact, a large house into that kind of context. So a full understanding of the context before we started placing buildings into it was key. And again here, dealing with old buildings, this is a new pumping station out in East London, but uh, sitting alongside a, a lovely old listed uh, Victorian pumping station in the background. So the idea of the old and new coexisting and understanding fully what the old was about was key to us in terms of how we went forward. And again here, uh, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, obviously a, a very important and world-renowned uh, building, but um, how you begin to allow yourself to allow modern forms and shapes to sit and coexist with the old. Um, and you can see here that we're not afraid of perhaps 
returning slightly more to a more literal interpretation of what Potton is there. This is at uh, Newnham College in Cambridge, where we uh, inserted the, a new linear uh, student halls and residence next to the old building that you can see in the background. So the idea of the two coexisting, but the new building feeding off the old in terms of its clues about uh, how its elevations look, its form, its detailing, but at the same time producing something which is inherently a fresh and uh, new interpretation and a modern version of it. Uh, this is recently finished, this is at uh, Girton College in Cambridge. A similar kind of approach, uh, a Victorian red brick uh, girls uh, uh, college, um, which uh, again is organised around a courtyard, and this is a new uh, uh, student hall building that we built to complete uh, an unfinished courtyard. So again, it's about making spaces besides building the buildings. So that brings me on a little bit onto housing. <coughs> As we got larger, we started moving into the world of um, developer housing, which is, tends to be what I tend to get more involved with in the office now. Um, we, it's a difficult world, obviously, dealing with uh, tough developers and building, in a sense, responsible buildings in the city that have relevance. This is an early building that we did uh, at Grove the Dock. Uh, it's, it obviously, again, it was in a, a, a sitting next to a listed building, an old pumping station in the background, Victorian pumping station. And here, I think we um, elected to begin to reference the idea of um, Victorian warehouses to sit alongside that. So these were a pair of buildings which sat across a lot from each other. In St Andrew's Bow in East London, again, um, interest in courtyard housing. This is uh, one of quite a lot of awards this. And I think this, this project was very much about the idea of um, producing tight urban environments for new people to live in uh, and where for instance, you, you could build tall, you could build small, you have terraced houses at low level here, and they would begin and could begin to emerge and form larger buildings and court buildings in the background. So the idea of finding a, a typology that could exist to make new streets, make new courtyards, and contribute to the, 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 the fabric of the city at the same time is very important to us. Um, this is the inner courtyard here. So you can sculpturally have fun with these elevations too. But there's lots of details in this which we're keen on. We've developed things like this is a very sculptural facade. It's just brick, striped brickwork, very simple, cheap material. It's something that we really enjoy and something which is very relevant to London. Um, again, down at, uh, <coughs> over at um, Barrier Park, a uh, uh, housing scheme there, simple use of brickwork in very rep repetitious, rational facades in terms of access balconies to flats around the garden court. On, on, the inner, on the inner face, and then around the outer face you have the white stucco villas which overlook a much bigger park. So the idea of how you relate to a big, smaller courtyard space versus a larger, more traditional uh, London park, although this is one of the newest London parks, if it not the newest London park, uh, to be built for about 100 years, I think. But this flanks the east side of that new park on the east, east London train. Right? So there's a, there's a reference here to the white stucco buildings of Nash and so that we, we know in London so well. Um, and now we're moving up in scale a little bit. Uh, this is uh, Broadway Chambers, again in brickwork. Uh, we did a couple of towers, we're now beginning to get into residential buildings. I'm not going to dwell on these in too much detail, there's quite a few of them. But as you can see, the scale is enlarging. This is now a work that we do, we've been doing about, I suppose, five, six years ago now. Um, so the scale of our work is becoming bigger and bigger. And we are beginning to move into this realm of master planning. And as we get bigger, as our projects get bigger, invariably our interest in how the city works makes us and forces us into thinking about master planning. And, and nicely so, because I think now someone referred to us the, uh, the other day as, as a practice that um, used to be a, a, a practice of architects in master planning, and they're now referring to us as a, a practice of master planners that have to do architecture. And I think that's, in a sense, we see that as a compliment, because I think to understand the city and produce good master planning, master planning projects is at the heart of now what we do. So these are all smaller projects and, that have come out of larger master plans. And this is just along the, a scheme that we're doing for ourselves, a little housing scheme on the corner near our, our offices. Large, um, towers in a larger housing scheme in North London. Uh, this is on site at the moment, Eileen House uh, in, in uh, South London. And even up to the scale of these kind of things, this is Oxford Square, 
two very large 50-story residential towers in uh, West London, which have now just got planning permission, and we're thinking I should be on site for about six months. Uh, and then we are doing commercial building towers as a result. We're moving into the city. We've also got 100, this is 100, 100 Bishop Gate, which um, it, we hope we, uh, we designed this about four or five years ago, but uh, it needed the developer to press the, the green button and say yes, build it, and he's just done that. So we're hopeful that we might build our first city tower as well. Um, three master plans now, um, in a bit more detail. Bank side, this is right next to, you saw this, at least this project slightly in the background of the office building, uh, our own office building. Our own office building is just in here, in that little gap that you can see there. Um, this is St. Christopher's house, which is the, when it was built, which is this building here, was the largest office slab block built in Europe in the 1960s. Um, and what it did, whilst it obviously was great in terms of the accommodation it produced for office workers, it completely severed any north-south connection across beyond the Bankside power station, which is obviously now um, the Tate Modern, uh, and across the Millennium Village up to St. Paul's. And when we were asked to look at that site, we were very keen to, first and foremost, decide, before we even started looking at the buildings, to understand how the city worked around it and what we could bring to it in terms of new connections. So this is the, was the current situation at the time, to Christopher's house, no penetration around, apart from around the edges of this block, across into the city itself. So we proposed a series of buildings as opposed to um, something similar to a single building that allowed for the first time new roads and streets to exist through and around our buildings and then make new connections uh, into the Tate Modern and potentially through the new route that would exist eventually through the centre of Tate Modern across the Millennium Bridge and up to St Paul's. So that uh, is a fundamental move and uh, is, is indicative of the things that we're kind of interested in in the city about making new connections, making new spaces um, as much as we are the buildings themselves. And so you can see here, this is the current, this is the Millennium Bridge, St Paul's, the Tate Modern, and the three buildings that we placed uh, at, in, in this location, we are up to the south of the Tate Modern. And here is basically the route through that we're connecting, and potentially through our own building, see in that little location there, through on the ground floor of our building, there's a passageway which links you through beyond to the hinterland to the south of London. Um, and these are the three buildings we, we designed. You can see here that there's strong public realm now being created all around these buildings. Uh, our ground plan was, was very important to us. You can see not only routes around the buildings, but routes through the buildings, and then retail <coughs> embedded in the ground floor of that arrangement which brings fantastic life to the city again, uh, as opposed to the, the gated uh, edge condition that was there previously. The buildings are strong in terms of their architecture at higher level, quite simple uh, rational facades in many ways, have facets on them, in, uh, but they are simple, straightforward buildings, but they make complex spaces, and these are um, some of the spaces around the edge. And we like the way it's now being inhabited with, with odd things, like this little television screen, which is which they put there when Wimbledon is on, for instance, in the summertime. And um, they put deck chairs out, and at lunchtime, that space is absolutely packed with people watching Wimbledon, or even, indeed just having their lunch. And it's, it's just a wider than uh, a normal kind of street, but it actually is totally pedestrianised. And, and because there's now 4,000 people just in one of those buildings alone, just in terms of the workforce, it's a busy environment during the week. But also, there are now residential accommodation uh, buildings being built around that location. So this is really set off uh, in the suburb, um, quite a regeneration zone as a whole, not only on the site, but to the area completely around it. King's Cross, um, I'll whittle these through because I've got a lot to get through, but I'll try and be as quick as I can. Uh, this is uh, obviously in, in the northern part of the centre of London. Uh, you have King's Cross Station, it's a Panker station here. Uh, massive, in terms of the Industrial Revolution, massive railway lines in Victorian times, uh, and huge warehouse buildings in here, which where the track would, would drop off by carriage, drop off by canal, from the Regent's Canal that runs through the middle, um, connection by train, all this activity it was a, a massive industrial hub in Victorian times. But of course, that now has, has changed. These lovely old uh, buildings, like uh, the Granary Building here, you can see in the Regent's Canal in the foreground. Um, 
was that when we were asked to master plan this area as a whole, we saw it as a great opportunity not only to deal with some of the lovely existing Victorian buildings that were there, but also to reconfigure that, the, the, uh, the, the urban landscape from what was once here like this, which you can see uh, 1862 before they built St Pancras. Here you can see St Pancras Station now in this location, uh, and then you, uh, the King's Cross here, and this massive amount of infrastructure in terms of where it like, railway lines and Newton's Canal through the centre, and even the gas holders that were once there, which are also listed in buildings now, interestingly enough, which we do have to keep in some form or other. Um, so we set about, this is an important drawing for us, um, specifically responding to the fabric uh, that was there in terms of the railway lines, the brain of the railway lines, the actual state of the condition that when we inherited it. Um, and try to set out, utilising the existing granary building as a heart and centrepiece of the scheme, the regions can out through the middle, the spaces that we created at the forefront of the granary building, um, but then placing uh, a series of commercial taller buildings in this location here, reinforcing the grain and, uh, of the railway lines that were once there, but then more residential zones, so some commercial around the back here. And so Martin School of Art now have occupied that, which has brought great life to this, to the heart of the scheme. And although St. King's Cross is now only half built out, this is already a thriving community. Um, but we were quite rigorous about how we decided on the scale of spaces, the scale of streets. We actually did this quite uh, in-depth investigation into uh, various streets in London in, in terms of their, the scale of their elevations versus the width of the street and the angle of the, of the skyline above it. So all these studies um, <coughs> were intrinsically important to us as we move forward with the project. And then we also had to work with the developers in, in terms of finding ways of um, defining uh, building parcels, I suppose you could say, finding parameter plans for each parcel that allow flexibility for individual architects to come in and build, but at the same time enough control that the overall would, would have some overall coherence as a, as a whole. And you can see here, this is the final uh, master plan itself with the granary building in the centre, a big ma massive public space in front of it. Um, it's now already thriving with restaurants, cafes, which is interesting because, of course, the whole of this edge is rather cut off, particularly in this area, from the, from the rest of the connection to the, the west side of the site. So to enable this space to be lively and, uh, and function as a piece of city is quite difficult because the connections are always there to make. But I think we, we seem to have achieved that already, although half the only half has been, been built out. And so this is central space with the gas holders converting into residential in the background, you can see. Um, and finally, the Olympic master plan and master plans. Um, here, you, as you know full well that we hosted the Olympics in 2012, great success. Uh, we were the master planners for the Olympic Park. <coughs> and interestingly, that didn't particularly involve that much building, we didn't did build some buildings, but most of it was about uh, how to reconnect the east side of London to, to the, to the centre of London. And you'll see here, this is, uh, the centre of London is over here, this is what we call East London, and then there's an area beyond that, which is uh, even more East Leeds, and here we have the Lee Valley, and you see the River Lee running up here, um, very low level of marshes and so on that, uh, that sit in this uh, happy marshes at the top of the reservoirs. Um, this area in the centre particularly was an industrial wasteland really. Uh, and to, to move from what is the, the, the west side of the Lee Valley to the east side is incredibly difficult. Um, you could do it via main artery routes of railway lines and dual carriageways, but to move across there via ordinary streets and, and, and avenues was incredibly difficult. In fact, they were virtually non existent. What we proposed, this is what it was like at present, or was like at the time we we master plan it. You can see the Lee Valley runs in the middle here. This is a mapping of, for instance, all the main roads and, and tertiary roads on, on the west side and on the east side. You can see there's a definite missing of those kind of things in the middle, apart from the roads and the other lines that run across in, the, in, the, in terms of dual carriageways and main thoroughfares. And this diagram, this kind of bar chart we did on the left, was quite interesting for us because it mapped out all the roads on the west side and all the roads on the east side of the valley and then the major connectors and you can see the difference in the valley itself because there's a great lack of connection. 
So what we set out to do was to make a series of what we originally proposed was about 50 new bridges across the river Lee to reconnect the west and east. Um, you see now in the centre there are now via those bridges many, many new connections. But I think even in the final scheme we ended up building actually about 40 of those bridges. Some were only good foot bridges and some major, major road bridges. But they did reconnect the east to the west of the side of the Lee Valley. And you can see here the difference. Um, and you can see here, for instance, 2006, when we took on the project, the industrial buildings that sat in the centre of the Lee Valley, uh, <clears throat> and now the actual Olympic Park itself, uh, with the new stadium, uh, some of the temporary arenas in the middle, and then the, uh, the Venedrade and so on at the north. And this, in terms of the concept, was, was our scheme. There's um, Zaha Hadid's uh, aquatic centre here, and this is strapped to the centre, on, which obviously now is bringing new life to the place too, with a new channel tunnel railing leading across there. So from being a place in London where um, I suppose it's very difficult to move through uh, a wasteland as such in terms of industry, we've now, via the Olympics, had the opportunity, and it was the Olympics that was the generator for this, had the opportunity to, to regenerate a whole uh, quarter, or even more so, of London itself into what is now the most important part of the plan, which is the legacy. What's happened after the Olympics? I mean, there are, as you know, many examples of the Olympics, perhaps, where it hasn't quite worked so well when, when it's over. For, right from the outset, our most important aspect of this was to make sure that the legacy worked, uh, and that the, the temporary stadiums were replaced with new housing areas. And so the whole area now around the edge of the River Lee has become, uh, and there's quite a lot of this already being built on site, um, has, has got new communities, new, uh, uh, new uh, retail areas, uh, new thoroughfares, new roads, new avenues, new boulevards. But obviously at the same time, a new park, which is still obviously flourishing and fundamental to the, to the centre of the, the scheme of the whole. Uh, and that's uh, obviously just taken just after the Olympics, or just during the Olympics itself, with some of the temporary arenas in the foreground. All those bridges there are now uh, have, have remained, and the park is, is thriving in the public. Um, so this really moved us into, and for, I suppose only last year, we um, had done quite a lot of master planning by this stage, and I think it provoked the publishing of this book, The Public Place, which is not so much um, a monograph of the work of the practice, it's more about a series of essays about master planning, series of essays and observations about the city and the things that we are really interested in uh, in our projects and also uh, wider issues about how the city works as a whole. Um, and this was shown in there, it's a, a, it was also, I suppose, it happened slightly before the book, but it was a little exhibition we did um, about master planning, what makes good master planning. And you can see all the various um, key lines there that I suppose we feel out find important to what makes a successful master plan. Um, they're postcards in the end. We made them into a series of postcards and we get them out in the office to people that are interested. Um, but what I thought I might do is, in, in terms of this point in time, I would highlight just four of these postcards and talk a little bit more about them. Because whilst this is about master planning, I think uh, there are a number of these, uh, I suppose, um, tab lines, which in a sense you could apply to buildings again. So from exploring master plan, you can go back into buildings and say actually a lot of these postcards and the, uh, and the sentences that we put on them apply to buildings as well. Um, for instance, this one, the potential uh, of the pre-existing, exploited. Um, the history of, and topography of the site are important, not only because they help explain the nature of the past, but because they can inform the shape of its future. And a good example of this, we, we tend to use this a little bit, it's Michelangelo's Campagonia in Rome. Uh, the medieval pre-existing buildings that he inherited to, to look at. The way that he quite simply lined them um, by, uh, with, with new architecture, but actually the space remained the same. He actually, uh, I suppose, kept the form of the building in the background, reclad it, put in a formal staircase and a fountain in the foreground kept the common Navy building that was there previously, but obviously relined it, but then mirrored that building on the other side. So something that was fundamentally slightly um, informal became very formal. Um, and I suppose it was, uh, you might say that he, it's part of Roman that he built, which was both 
physically and metaphorically on the, on the history and topography of the site uh, of itself. And I think in many ways it's, it's, um, it's interesting the way that it's, it's a new space in many ways. Uh, Marcus Aurelius place on axis with a building in the background. And yet somehow it's completely what it was previously to. So I think it's these kind of things, this idea of reinventing the old, but making new spaces out of the old, uh, but at the same time uh, the idea of, of the reference to the old being very strong as a starting point. This one here, complex spaces with simple buildings, I think this probably speaks for itself. Um, this is an interesting one for me. I worked quite a long time in Finland for a while. And, and Alto himself refers to this in some of his work in terms of master planning. This is the Nienan Tovra, which is the Finnish farmstead. Um, interestingly, because you can see here, very simple rectilinear buildings uh, around the central space, making the complex space in the middle, but actually made from very simple, um, straightforward wooden buildings of the era. Um, and I think it's those kind of moves that we enjoy, the idea of making a space from simple buildings. It's a complex space, but they're simple rectilinear buildings. And a clear hierarchy, looking at, at, in terms of providing that, um, yes, it's true in terms of uh, providing a clear hierarchy for a master plan in the city, um, but equally uh, how the buildings respond to that hierarchy in the streets. And this is Alto's bookshop. Um, there's no coincidence here, I've talked about Alto twice already, but, but the idea that he, in the Alto bookshop here, the academic bookshop, he, this is the um, Esplanade here, that a major. Uh, street in second Helsinki. This is a secondary street. Um, and the only way he's acknowledged it in the building itself by the way that he's inlaid in this facade uh, uh, white marble uh, in surrounds and not in this facade. So you do get um, a reference and I suppose a marking of the major and minor in, in, in the building itself. So it's these gestures, quite a modest building in many ways, but within it there's a, there's a subtlety and a complexity that uh, acknowledges the hierarchy of the city. And then finally this one, which is, um, again, prioritized space over form, which I suppose says something similar to the previous one in the way that this is about Japanese calligraphy and, and the space formed by the brush uh, is as important as the brush itself, which is about buildings, uh, the space of the pre buildings being as important as the building itself. So I'm now to talk about the three housing schemes I'm all right with this. I'm doing okay. Um, I'm going to start off with Highbury Square in North London here. Um, I keep on referencing where we are. Uh, the other one is Keepish House, which is, I suppose, South West London, and then New Mouth South in Dockhams. Um, what I want to highlight these three is in relation to housing, we've learned a lot out of our master planning. Uh, but I think uh, it comes back to these schemes about how we then begin to think of spaces within our projects. Uh, urban landscapes, I suppose you might say. Um, each of the spaces within these three projects are different, and they all re reference and refer to um, typologies and buildings types that have been uh, built in London over the last 200 years. The first one, I think, is probably refers, and the common to it's not the first one, but I think it's fairly obvious when you'll see it. Um, this is Hybrid Stadium, the old Arsenal Football Club here, uh, and obviously the new Arsenal Stadium here, the Emirates, which they now occupy. Our challenge when we built this was to refurbish, well, not refurbish, I suppose, reinvent what you could do with a, a disused football stadium. And the challenge was that this building here, the East Stand, was listed, an Art Deco listed building, which we couldn't remove. Um, <clears throat> challenging, really. This is the, the, the stadium itself uh, in the 30s, I think, just after we were going to be both of these buildings, the east and the west stand, were completed. Uh, it's embedded in the urban fabric. It's surrounded by terraced Victorian houses. Uh, and these houses now, quite large Victorian villas, have become quite popular in London and quite spread off the area, which perhaps 30, 40 years ago it wasn't. So it's quite a a, a good area now which developers and of course Arsenal Football Club saw as, convert, as a potential conversion to residential accommodation. Uh, but the question is how did you do that at the stadium whilst you keep the stadium in the background? Um, lots of heritage, lots of history. Uh, it's part of the community Arsenal Football Club. They've been there for such a long time. The, the locals know them well and in fact they enjoy the fact they're there. 
And there was a lot of community feedback and interaction between Arsenal Football Club and, and the residents that lived nearby uh, prior to uh, them moving away from the stadium. Um, and the thought, the difficulty here was, as I say, is how to make uh, a decent residential scheme from a series of buildings like this. Should you uh, do not keep this building, demolish all the other three? Uh, <clears throat> how can you convert this into residential? Difficult. Um, there's, over time, there's lots of examples. We sort of look at the amphitheatre there of, of uh, Romans, I think second century Roman amphitheatre, how that was converted eventually into creating the piazza there uh, in, in, in residential. Um, there's Arl here in, in the middle and on the right hand side. This is more its current condition where it was inhabited uh, three or four hundred years by residential after having been a theater, an amphitheater, almost fortress like for a while. Uh, but then, obviously, more recently, it's returned to its theater state. So it's interesting the way um, stadiums do get re inhabited and reused over time. And it can happen, it can work. Um, here's a view down Avenue Road, looking at the Arsenal Stadium on the left hand side. You can see the kind of context it's in. To understand that context was important to us, the scale of the buildings around the stadium, how we could not only respond to the scale of the building internally, but also how we could step it down to the scale of the buildings that surround it. Um, the stadium itself in a pretty sorry state. Uh, you can see here this is the, the list of buildings in the foreground. Um, we elected in the end, uh, this is the earlier scheme to keep the stand and the west stand, which was locally on the stand, and keep the actual area of the pitch, uh, because we felt, um, in terms of the developer too, that his aspirations for giving numbers of units on the site, you can imagine, was high. And we felt that one well, we could get two things out of this. A, we could retain the space and the memory of the arena, that was once there. Um, but B, we could probably achieve good height and residential unit numbers by maintaining height around that space as opposed to leveling it and producing a series of three-story terraced houses. So we elected to keep the West End, which almost matches in terms of its architecture from the 30s, the East End, uh, create a, a garden in the middle, uh, and then introduce uh, taller buildings north and south to replace the existing stands, and then use houses uh, uh, to the north and the south of that, which offered a kind of um, an intermediary solution uh, to the lower scale uh, terraced houses surrounding. So there's some early sketches, you can see the large buildings here, um, and you can see the news houses here, some of the old existing entrances into the stadium that we kept in the, in the corners, and some little news houses that we infill in, uh, around the edge of the site. Um, and then obviously the simple plans inside, quite a deep block for the stadium itself, uh, the back of the commons, I'll show you in a second how we can cope with the section. Uh, a car park beneath all this, underneath the whole of the pitch, so the pitch uh, removed, uh, a new park and new facility uh, inserted, and then a new guard in the middle. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the garden because Christopher, who's here to talk in a minute, <laughs> was the designer of that garden. Uh, and, but I think it highlights for us the sense that, that the space, again, becomes the focal point of this scheme not the buildings themselves, and that's very important to us in many, many of our schemes. Uh, you can see here, this is the latest, or the latest iteration, where we did amend, in the end, the north and south conditions to make smaller courtyards instead of the news houses. Uh, that was, a, I suppose, uh, from a reaction, a discussion with the, with the developer in terms of the typologies that we were creating. But in a sense, instead of creating news houses here, we created um, uh, obviously, large space and then five smaller courtyards in the north and south. And of course, what this re relates to is, is a traditional London Square. It's interesting, this photograph um, is a typical London Square, it's the same scale here as a photograph of the built project. And so you see that, in a sense, it has the scale of a, of a London Georgian Square that we're obviously very familiar with in London. Um, something that I think um, is, uh, how can I say, uh, um, familiar in many ways. Um, so these are some of the images uh, that I'll run through quickly, transfer, transforming it into the scheme you see in the centre here, some CGI's, the, the actual built form here. I won't say too much about the garden, but these are Christmas thoughts about water walls, which uh, 
and not only provide activation to the space in terms of flowing water up and down the, the skins, but also cleverly allow ventilation into the car park beneath. Uh, the view from one of the balconies. Uh, and now I come on to the idea of how do you convert um, a listed football stadium stand into residential. Difficult, really. This is the section. Uh, you see an open terrace here and a lower, ter lower tier here. Um, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you convert that in, uh, and at the same time still somehow maintain the, the, the nature of the memory of what it was previously? Uh, we started looking at ideas, of course we had to fill in the floor plates and so on. But we, we were very interested in, in providing a very glassy facade here, even double height spaces wherever we could. Accommodation in the roof scape, perhaps, in, in, in terms of the trusses. Uh, and the structure was very set, it was a four metre day structure that we had to allow all our flats to work within. Uh, and the, the final thing was, you can see here, this, this memory of the terrace which we thought we could try and provide although you don't just see it through the windows, the sense of staircases up on the balconies, and if we could provide enough of those, there was the sense of just that glimmer of a memory um, of, of, the, of the tiers that, that, that were there once before. So we ended up with a kind of section that was pretty much like this. Um, yes, it's filled in with glass, but it's as transparent as we can make it, and it does allow um, an openness to, to really figure on this side of the scheme versus the more monolithic nation facade and the smaller bedrooms that occur on the roadside facade. And then some clever flats that exist in the roof, in terms of roof lights, some great views across London. Uh, and these are the nighttime views. You can see that this is the infill now, and in this is CGI for space. Um, but the intention, of course, is to make those facades to, as, as, as open as, as transparent as possible. We have sliding windows that in the summertime can slide back. Um, and allow um, great ventilation for double height spaces. And this is the space itself. Uh, this is taken up probably two or three years ago now, so I haven't been back there recently, but Chris may have a, Christopher may have a uh, later photograph of that. And these are the smaller courtyards here to the south. You know, so I'll run back. You can see the courtyard entrances here and here. Mm -hmm. And this is moving into the smaller courtyards, which again, the language here is glass. Uh, I think we're interested in terms of the materiality to. <coughs> produce um, a material palette that, A, in terms of the internals, is light, glass, and metallic. Uh, you get to the news houses that, that sit around the scheme, uh, and they have a, a softer, a more intimate feel about the render. And then you move out to the streetscape, where you have brick, which is the, the common uh, material for the streets around in terms of Victorian terraces. You can see the, the old uh, building itself uh, in the distance there, and the Victorian building on the right hand side. And this is the new refurbished stadium itself, uh, it's, uh, facade, and, and some of the residential bonds the street on the right hand side. And there are the refurbished entrance to the old marble halls. Um, Keepage House. This is in southwest London. Uh, an interesting scheme because uh, it's on the site of an old telephone exchange, a large big slab lock uh, that was inserted in the 60s into this area of the city. Surrounded by industry against the river on the north side, uh, a viaduct, uh, and, but then the remnants of quite lovely red brick um, Victorian mansion blocks on the south side, and a park on the corner, and finally a listed church. Actually, it's not listed, but it's in the, in the uh, uh, <coughs> conservation area, a little tiny church on the corner of our site there. This is the, the old building itself. We did actually look at refurbishing it, but of course, in terms of floor, floor heights, uh, and the, the difficulty of cause and so on, it, 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 it soon uh, it was decided to create a new scheme. You can see the, the site itself just off the edge here. This is the conservation area, and the church itself sits right on the edge of our site, which is this one here. On the corner. So we, we had to be um, sensitive to the fact that we were right next to this rather lovely park, surrounded by some lovely houses. How did we do that? And at the same time, um, respond to a quite demanding brief by the plant in terms of producing a very high quantum of residential on the site. Um, so, significant buildings, you can see I mentioned it already, this is the old building on the site. Uh, these, these are a decent Victorian brick buildings, some, uh, some great uh, mansion box, the church, a nice mansion box here, and some further down the road. Um, a bit of a cue, I suppose, a bit of a hint as to where we might take it in terms of the, the, the typologies uh, for this particular site. 
And I suppose I should say at this point, um, when we did Arsenal, yes, there was a, there's always a, been a housing shortage in London, but it's much more critical now than it was 10 years ago when Arsenal was conceived, I suppose, in terms of the, the project. And I think in recent years, architects in London have really been trying to find new ways of building more densely, with typologies that work, still give good, decent um, spaces between buildings, but, uh, but provide a potential to go up, to build taller, and, and are the references for things that have been done before, where that's been successful. Uh, and unlike the reference to the Georgia Square earlier, then I think there are other things that we picked up that we might refer to in terms of this scheme, particularly the Victoria Mansion lot. We've seen hints of that in here in terms of these buildings, but then the existing building in the background. Um, but this is some of the buildings around the site. The Victoria Tower on our site, some of the very two nice Jordan buildings, some Victorian buildings, the Victoria Mansion lot, as you can see here. Quite a complex set of buildings around our site. We do a Victorian pub on the corner here, in different kind of brickwork, quite a modest scale too. So the scale of buildings around is quite, quite big. Uh, but also besides that, uh, in the, the opportunity area, which is right on the other side of the railway line here, in this area, there's a massive amount of new residential work being built. There's the Baptist and Power Station project here, there's the new uh, American Embassy uh, project just here, the Embassy Quarter by Bunnamore, no, we're doing, we're doing the, the um, nine hours master plan at that point here, so a lot of new residential is being built at the moment. But our scheme sits on the other side of the railway line, right next door to some very large, tall towers. And you can see here, this is what's coming forward in this zone here against the hillside. side. And our scheme, even on this side of the, the, uh, the viaduct, there's some tall building being produced. Our scheme is here, this is the old post office building, and uh, you can see the park on the right hand side. So how do we respond to that? Is the site itself in detail? We looked at it very simply by the site, the clean site, filling it with accommodation, the plot itself, carving it with a series of courtyards, A in the centre of the scheme, B to, to provide space for the church itself, um, accommodation around those spaces. So these become more informal shapes, I suppose, more, uh, but still roughly based on rectangles. That begin to form, more, form, as I said more earlier, simpler buildings that form more complex spaces within, uh, garden-like spaces, as opposed to squares, I suppose you might say. And the upper levels too, quite complex typologies, mansion box scale in principle, I suppose you can see here some of the references. Uh, uh, the idea that mansion box actually were built for the wealthy in, in London, really trying to seek a way of living more densely, other than the kind of villas that you might find around the Regent's Park in the Georgian area uh, of, of London. So this is a time when densification in London was beginning to happen in, in, in Victorian times. Um, so built, people were building up, but at the same time they were building very ornately as well. So that in a sense they had still had their palaces because they were spending money on their facades, but they were, they were living much closer together, which you can see in these examples. And equally, there was this touch of the warehouse, this, the, the sense of uh, height that could be created on the site too, because over the other side of the tracks there were um, warehouses and things, so there was a reference to the industrial landscape. We began to see it this way in terms of uh, informal spaces, uh, roofscape, uh, which you can see is referred to in terms of some of these reference points, the rich sort of simple rhythm across the facade, but the way in which uh, uh, building facades are made by that opening is that simple demonstration systems, the richness of some of these Victorian blocks. The idea that on each floor the plan is slightly different because the elevations are articulated differently. In principle, they are the plans internally are really very much the same. Um, so these are the kind of things that we are beginning to think about here in terms of a reference point. You can see the, the roofscape now and how it's developed. This here is a very simple ridge, ridge like building, mansion blocks against South Lambeth Road. Smaller buildings is against Wyville over here, against that pub I should mention to you earlier on. And then taller buildings at the back of the site, much taller buildings, about 35, 40 storeys we're proposing here. Whereas these are about 8 or 9, 10, yeah. and internally, and these are down to about 3 or 4. So three different scales, basically, that we're looking at on the site. Um, and different identities for these buildings, too. Um, so there are a series of buildings, you can see it. Anything from the, the church here, the, the pub building I mentioned, the scheme that sits next to it, the mansion box, there was a possibility of introducing a school on the corner up to the drawing buildings at the back of the site. 
And then they, as a, as a collection of buildings, collaborate to begin to form the spaces between. Um, and it's, so it's about the space as well, besides it, about the buildings, as it is always with our work. Actually. So this is a model that we made of the, of the buildings. You can see not only is there like, the garden space, the more informal garden space in the centre, but there are roof gardens at higher level in between uh, some of the taller buildings. Uh, and then the language of buildings, um, unashamedly, really, we began to really explore this idea of the connection to the Victorian action blocks, the scale of the site, how they worked. And these were details of the relations that we looked at at the time. Um, <clears throat> anything from the smaller terrace buildings that uh, 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 were adjacent to the pub, stepping up to the 89 story buildings next door, the larger buildings, the mansion blocks that sat against the main road, and then the taller buildings you can see in the background. And the courtyard buildings themselves, similar kind of scale to the mansion block buildings, and then the tall buildings in the distance, which were subtly different. And as you moved up the building, you see we, we began to explore the nature of the fenestration as it moves up the building. The fenestration changes from being war changing to what in effect became frame as a structure at the top. And then these balconies, these setbacks at different levels to create a much thinner, slender tower as, as one reached the top. So we end up with a scheme like this. Something which we feel is um, obviously responds to our client's brief in terms of density, solves the issue of density on a site of this type of quality, but at the same time responds to its edge conditions all the way around in a very particular way. Moving now to East London, this is obviously West London foreground, I suppose the, the uh, <coughs> uh, objectified foreground leading beyond St Paul's to what you see in the distance, which was East London and the industry in the background. Um, to, to an area here, which is, this is the Isle of Dogs, this is the Docklands generally, um, that we refer to as the O2 Arena, once called the Dome in that location. Our site here was just south of the Olympic Park, which you know, the Alpha the River Lee, um, right in the thick of the, of, the, of the Docklands area. You can see our site is just here, so an old map of the Docklands. Uh, before a lot of those dots were filled in. It's an area wharf area in the middle. Um, this is what the dots were once like. And we, from this image, we also took some cues and the reference point for this scheme being much more to do with the typologies of East London uh, and I suppose the reference point to the building types of East London, i.e., being warehouse buildings. It's like this very strong linear quality of the buildings now as they hit the edges of water and so on. You can see it very strongly at East London. In, in many, many locations around the edge of the water. How could that help us in, in solving this site, forming something that's relevant in relation to the past history, but also relevant to the site itself in terms of the future? Um, the site here is it's very island like as it moves around, as the river really, uh, enters from the River Thames north. Um, but uh, also a fantastic site in relation to the views across the river. Uh, Holy there on the site itself. It's now full of warehouses, nothing much remains of the old fabric, but there are some rather lovely buildings in this location, like an old lighthouse building, some quite some 30 buildings in this location, again, as you can see, this rather linear type of roofscape. Um, but even some of these buildings you can see take up that are of reasonable age uh, remain on the site. But the larger warehouses have simple flat roofs or near flat roofs, of which we, uh, those we are not so much we responding to in terms of their scale. Um, but we have a water's edge condition pretty much all the way around our site. But we have a strong linear road which feeds um, Trinity Boy Wharf in this location here. Um, and one in which, however we get there, we must maintain a road through. But we enjoy the linearity of this road, really. We thought it was very, very good for something we should hold on to and make the centre point of the scheme. And I, we'll see why in a minute. Um, but the rest of the, the site, as you can see, it went, has wonderful opportunities for views across to things like the O2 Arena in the distance, but its current state is poor. Um, but the East India Docks, as it once was, our site is, is that area just there. Um, this is the kind of area that it was in the, in the um, mid 19th or early 19th century. Um, this is the Trinity Boy Wharf at the lighthouse itself. The uh, these are some of the buildings that sat on the island. You can see workers' housing in the foreground, but you can see these bigger, long, linear, uh, pitched roof buildings of the warehouses and factory buildings in the distance. But some height at points as well. Um, bad slide while we're out of focus, but on our site, there's a dry dock for a boat as well that has now been filled in. 
we wanted to see if we could maintain the memory of that. Um, so the site itself, we were interested in the simplicity of warehouse buildings and their facades, how do they contribute to what we do in terms of historic reference. Um, simple, simple facades, gestures at roof scale, in, at roof level, interesting, uh, <coughs> I suppose, silhouettes in terms of chimneys and so on. Um, the richness of facades as well, this is uh, and how, in terms of some of their cast ironwork and, and elements on the roof scale, and how they could contribute and begin to show contrast to the richness of the simple elevation. And even this, in terms of the rather uncomfortable somehow, um, profile, roofscape, urban roofscape, that's what you might say, a factory buildings from the past. And this kind of architecture, in terms of the ironwork, steelwork, could, could complement the simplicity of warehouse facades in brick. Uh, even things like this, entrances to warehouses, whether this kind of language might give us a clue as to where we might take this project. The richness of warehouse buildings in their frame, etc., the language and the texture. Um, even this is it's not quite on our site, but still exists today in central London at Butler's Wharf, a series, of, a series of connecting bridges between warehouses. This richness of cast ironwork in relation to the brick buildings either side. But then the textures of the ground, a uh, hard landscape here, the, the, the sense of instead of re referencing things like garden squares and informal gardens themselves referencing things like factory yards, the kind of informality of the incidental buildings that are placed in, in um, factory yards, well, that again is a clue. So, and you can see here, this idea of a linear road through the middle of our site, with, I suppose, linear buildings at right angles in terms of uh, roofscape to that, and whether that kind of relationship was a simple yet effective way of organising the site. So you can begin to see here the sense of maintaining the road through the middle of the site, but creating a series of spaces between buildings in terms of a north-south linearity. Of course, in terms of organizing buildings in terms of deeper plans, the north-south orientation is, is good, as opposed to east-west. So the sense that you might along uh, Orchard Place, which is the road on the site as it once was, um, uh, you might accentuate that by low-level buildings and yards in between taller buildings. Use pit roofs at high level to create height and I suppose that higher a cigarette that one's looking for. Um, but then the landscape in between them. Uh, and uh, and those three elements, the, the small, I suppose the small, the intermediate, and the tall, and then the spine itself, uh, and, uh, are are uh, intrinsically important to the scheme itself. And the reference obviously to the yard and the informality of some of the spaces that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that, that occur in the yard. So we started a bit like, funny enough, in the same way that we started with Keybridge House, but with a different goal in mind, the idea that, that there are a series of roofs that we can place north-south across the site. Um, and then there are a series of routes uh, across the site east-west and north-south that we might provide to, so beginning to form the buildings, really. And then the spaces themselves, so not only did we create the lower um, three-story building around the should place, it created um, more interesting forms uh, and spaces with um, simple linear uh, pitch roofs and gables and north south. This, I may add, began to soften in terms of the, the informality of some of these edges because, in terms of planning the buildings internally, conceptually it was interesting, but it ended up becoming much more rectilinear and probably rightly so. So, this was the starting point of the buildings, but as they developed, you can begin to see that the rectilinear grain came. And some of the taller buildings that we ejected took on a slightly freer form because of the nature of that slightly rather, rather top-heavy, uncomfortable quality that we were hoping to gain in relation to those previous references versus the, the um, intermediate and low-level picture buildings. You see here the spaces where we begin to create yards, and we begin to create, um, I suppose, places for play. Uh, so there was an alteration between the yard and the garden because there needed to be private space, there needed to be yards, more public space. And so we alternated it between the lawyers. And then there was this, this sketch that was drawn by Vergon, which again, I suppose, reinforced this idea of low-level gables, uh, intermediate buildings, and then the taller um, silhouette of slightly awkward industrial buildings that might um, once have existed in the area. But, but referencing those in a way that might um, give us taller buildings that were residentially there. 
Um, and where could those tall buildings sit within the site? Of course, there are issues about overshadowing the Trinity Royal Wharf here. Uh, and so they were placed at the back of the site so that they, they are shadows over, over shadow the, the river itself and not the courtyards. Uh, so this is one of the early sketches that we did for the competition itself, um, which picks up the, um, the yards between buildings, the more formal space in the middle, and of course this is where the dry dock once was. So we are, we are um, unashamedly kind of representing that in the groundscape. We, we looked at actually even opening it up at one point, but that was approved to step too far. Some early sketches, um, the plans themselves, quite simple plans internally, duplexes, um, triple uh, triplexes in terms of three-story houses across the uh, across the place, um, and then taller residential blocks uh, in the middle. Quite simple, straightforward plans. Um, developers are always pushing to make you gain reduced numbers of cores in terms of those uh, buildings as much as possible. So the flats are good. Probably the internal corridors are something that we wouldn't choose to do, but legislation in London at the moment allows you to do it. Um, although eight flats before is now um, a, a, a maximum. Um, lower level parking, um, which allows for the raised courtyards above, the upper level courtyards in this location for the lower level yards. Um, so uh, retail and leisure facilities on the water's edge, the upper level accommodation, and then the towers themselves. Towers, as I said, I think in terms of the language of buildings, we looked at them being different, uh, more frame-like, referencing other things that I've just shown you, um, so that they were lofty, they were slightly awkward in some respects, um, compared to the more traditional pitched roof uh, warehouse reference that you see at the base. Um, and these developed into uh, more detailed drawings, you can see the lower terraces along the front here, uh, into this long linear facade along the Witcher case, behind which uh, stepped up into an intermediate scale gable, series of gables, terraces cut out of them, up to the higher buildings that sit behind that. And then the detailing within them too. Um, so the detailing obviously is important to us too, but very much like uh, Keybridge House. Um, but these are simpler buildings, they're not as ornate, they are, their reference point more is to do simple warehouse buildings, but the buildings are well proportioned. Um, but the changefulness comes where we begin to carve out corners and provide balconies, um, little, I suppose, gestures in the, in the cable end at the top. But, but then there's a change in material. Uh, the clients, and I think rightly so, was interested in giving identity to each of the courtyards by changing the brick colour. Um, and, and then also changing the details around some of the windows, as you can see. Not quite, very subtly different. There's uh, string courses around this window, not previously. Even perhaps introducing different colored metal work on some of the buildings in the background. Um, so very similar, but yet not similar. Um, and then the finally, the actual uh, CGI's themselves. So this project uh, is about to get planning permission. Even the house I showed you before has got kind of permissions, it's about to go on site, and of course, hydrate is built. Um, and so, this is, sorry, this is the linear um, orchard place, the lower buildings. And as you can see, it's a very dense scheme, but we are having to find ways now to build building more densely. But dense in the sense, um, a kind of relevant density to a polygon here, I think, a reference to that. But something where all these flats get good views of water. Um, good daylight, good sun, daylight, sunlight, so all of them have to pass these tests, so although it's quite densely organised. Um, these are the yards, this is where obviously the, um, uh, uh, the dry dock was once, in terms of it's been expressed by the landscape architect in this location. We have a landscape architect involved from a very fairly early stage on this, and rightly so. Um, so, as always, as you can see, we've worked with landscape architects um, from an early stage on all these projects. Um, and it's an important part of any development or scheme that we do these days. Um, this is, these are the yards further back, so the more public spaces, the routes through the buildings. Um, so you can see the kind of warehouse in reference to the, the buildings as a whole. Quite a lot of variety, different heights, um, but a lot of repetition at the same time. And then the gardens between, which are set up a floor high, uh, which are obviously more informal and provide the children's play space. And then the views themselves from the river south across the River Thames. Finally, this is the last project, um, 
I thought it'd be interesting to, to take some of the things that we've learned from those three projects, and in a way, to show you how we've applied it to some of the events not too I mean, this is in, this is Beirut. We have had a uh, housing scheme we did, or certainly it's being built at the moment. Had a bit of a stall about a year ago, but it's now back on site. A housing scheme um, that we designed about three or four years ago. Um, I don't know if you know much about Beirut. The whole centre of Beirut was destroyed pretty much in the civil war from 75 to 90. Um, and a company called uh, Solidaire, who uh, um, state-supported uh, private developer, um, took on the whole renovation and rebuilding of the centre of Beirut. And you can see it, it was devastating, really. But beautiful buildings, as, as you can probably imagine. But they've rebuilt the centre of Beirut now to, to this kind of standard. Uh, and in incredibly rich facades, rich buildings themselves, good spaces throughout, good colonnade space, uh, good distances, good scale to the, to the heights versus the widths, all these kind of things in the scheme that we produce here and we want to learn from, um, and the richness of any of the elevations, as you can see. Um, uh, and things like not only the balcony details, the way in which the building stuck to get out on the colonnade, but also the roof scale. Um, so a very strong tripartite kind of approach to buildings. Um, the site itself, this was the area at the very centre of the what's called the, the Paris of the East, um, with our site just to the north here, uh, in, interestingly in the same kind of urban fabric, but unlike the centre, which there were a lot of remnants of the other buildings left, this was a completely bomb-damaged, wiped-out site. So there was nothing really there apart from the car park. But we did have relationships to make to buildings around in these areas here. Um, and so we were very interested in the way in which we could continue the nature of this kind of urban fabric, understand the history of the city. Uh, it has a, it's incredibly rich in terms of Roman um, upwards, in terms of the strata you can find throughout the city on all levels, literally on the different levels of the city. Um, and uh, we wanted to understand that. Um, and build those kind of subtleties and, and uh, I suppose, uh, spaces into our building. Um, it started with this kind of thing, understanding, as I probably mentioned already, the proximity between buildings, the roots of the buildings, the courtyard, the nature of courtyards, the nature of arcades, and then the details and materials. Um, we looked at a set of buildings that, again, were very simple. They were rectilinear buildings throughout. But what they did is, they made a series of complex spaces. I sound like I'm repeating myself, but it's, I am. It's, it's a very important part of what we do, is, is keeping the building simple but making the spaces complex and, 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 and intriguing and inviting uh, and humane. Um, this was a series of studies we did, assuming we were using rectilinear buildings, but our, our first approach to this was to create a series of routes, alleyways, um, piazzas, pocket parks in the scheme, uh, and compose those routes, compose those vistas. You can see here that we made a series of car models to understand exactly how we were composing. Quite a picturesque approach in a way. Um, and you can see here, uh, this is Alfredo in the background, who, who led the project at the time. Um, it's a, we went through a lot of different situations of this to understand, but it was very much about um, creating a foreground, a mid-ground, and then a very, uh, I suppose, focal point in the background. So the three levels to, to the vistas that we were trying to break in any one space. And you can see here, we ended up with 22 different rectilinear buildings that were very simple to plan internally. Very, very big flats on the had, not only in the intermediate levels, but extremely big flats, about 600 square meters uh, on, the top, on the other level. So they were luxury flats, there's no denying it. But what they did, they formed a series of larger buildings, each one being different, but each one forming the spaces. So the spaces between the buildings were more like this, of which we did many studies on to understand what is quite a complex change of levels across the site too. Um, so it's a combination of the, of the spaces and the ground floor condition levels are but basically retail throughout. So this was a warrant in a way of wonderful, literally wonderful, uh, intimate spaces, all having their own different identities in terms of the scale uh, and placement. Uh, the intermediate flat plans, all with their own balconies, looking over those spaces. And then the upper level world, which is very much one of, I suppose, 
um, much larger rooftop um, apartments, penthouses and so on, even with a series of swimming pools, as you can see on the top. So quite elitist on the top floor, and one must have to admit. But giving something hugely back to the public realm on the ground level. So we made a model of this quite a complex model to illustrate the roof scale um, and how do the elevations work with lots of sketches about the elevations. The idea is again about, about um, local and modern, the idea of the interpretation on the right hand side of, uh, of the local vernacular, what, what is actually currently there, and trying to reinvent that, I suppose, in a modern manner. Um, understanding the composition of the stars, you know, the idea of reiterating the tripartite composition. The idea that the central portion of any one of the buildings was always five stories high. What happened at the ground could be, I suppose, a bit more flamboyant, and certainly the top could be, but there was control about the central section of five stories. Um, and the idea of those five stories in principle um, it could be slab and pier in terms of its structure, or its implied structure, uh, the sense of wall and holes, grids, or even frames. Any one of those kind of conditions could happen within the street facades, but they basically provided a family of buildings, um, all different, or all intrinsically related in terms of some of those compositional relationships. Um, and how they sit in the seat, in the, in the streetscape. They sit in, they can move around, they're all slightly different, but, uh, but they provide, and even their roofscape provides a variety of the street, but a, but a continuity at the same time. And so these finishing off with a series of CGI's uh, it's not built yet, but it's just about coming out of the ground. So you see the richness of the space is not only in one, but the richness of the facades intermediate from high level too, and the spaces and the vistas through the ground up. The roof scope of the model. Um, and again, we, we tested this via this model quite, quite considerably. We made a number of different models to really understand whether we were getting the scale of the space as well. <coughs> and the roof terraces at the medium level. What does it look like at night time, which again is important there. Um, the low level night time, the roof spaces, uh, the upper levels, what is it like on the roof? These are the, the very big apartments that we've done with, with um, uh, swimming pools or something, night time shot. The larger internal apartments, uh, and then the ski itself. So, Thank you.